Hello and welcome to Let's Play Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous, with me, Bring It Down. Uh, Wrath of the Righteous is developed and published by Alcat Games, the same developer who brought us Pathfinder Keymaker, and is released on September 2nd, 2021. Wrath of the Righteous takes everything from Pathfinder Keymaker and expands and improves upon it in a new campaign, but this game is not a direct sequel. Uh, you can jump right into this without having played Keymaker, and it won't affect your understanding of the story. A uh, disclaimer before we continue, the rest of this episode will be nothing but character creation, where I go over every aspect of my build. So if that's not your bag of beans, feel free to skip ahead to the next episode, where we get into the action. I'm also going to try to offer some alternatives to the build, so if you're interested in the general concept, but not exactly how I'm playing it, I'll try to show or mention some of those other options. Well, let's jump into a new game. The main story. Join the struggle against the world wound. The epic war between Galarian and the Abyss has raged for more than a hundred years. Up to now, the Crusader armies have barely managed to curb the overwhelming enemy forces, but not for much longer. The demon lords are preparing to strike a decisive blow. You have to harness mythic powers, take command of the fifth crusade, and lead it against the demonic hordes. That reminds me, uh, one aspect of character creation I will not be covering in this episode is the mythic path. A mythic path is essentially a secondary, a very powerful, a uh, secondary class that you unlock alongside your primary class and levels up along with you. Uh, some examples are Angel, Demon, Devil, Azada, Lich, uh, things like that. I don't actually know which one I'm going to go yet. Uh, there's two that I've, I'm have i split between right now. I'm just going to see where the campaign takes me. I am going to this game completely blind. It's been very hard work. Uh, the beta has been out for a while and I've and struggling not to spoil anything for myself so let's go ahead and jump into the difficulty selection i'm going to play on core difficulty which is the replacement for challenging from kingmaker i do think that core is the most normal difficulty if you select normal uh, critical hits are weaker uh enemies are moderately weaker but if you select core critical hits are normal and there is no modifier to enemies enemy stats the only setting that I'm a little hesitant about is the number of enemies. Instead of standard, they are enlarged, but I'm going to keep it as is and see how we do. Uh, so core difficulty, uh, your character suffers full damage from enemies and traps. There are more enemies than usual. They have standard power and inflict the usual damage on critical hits. Uh, your character will die after suffering a deadly injury. If your main character dies, the game is over. If a companion dies, you can resurrect them with raised dead or a similar spell. Extremely expensive service, unavailable to most adventurers. I uh, can select a pre-built character if you're into that. I, that's boring. We're gonna make our own. So these are all the new portraits introduced with Wrath of the Righteous. But if you scroll down, you have all the portraits uh, from Keymaker as well. They did remove the monstrous portraits, uh, Hargolka and Vordekai. I'm not sure why. Anyway, a couple of portraits stand out to me. I really like this one. I think this make a good Stone Lord Paladin. And this one is my favorite out of all of them. Uh, this is easily the most represented I've been in a CRPG. I'm not quite as bulky in the face, but I have a very similar hairstyle and beard. We're going to be selecting uh, this portrait. Doesn't quite match my character's profile, but it's also the only male Dampier <laughs> portrait, and that's what we're going to be playing, is a uh, Dampier. We'll just pretend this is his casual wear. Very uh, Vampire Hunter D-esque. Alright, and we're going to be playing a Cavalier. Uh, I'm going to go over the base class, and then the... I'm going to go over all the archetypes briefly, but only go into detail on the archetype that we're going to be playing. So a cavalier is a warrior who has an animal companion, a faithful steed they can ride into battle. They are strong melee fighters who can also empower their allies. So features and abilities, uh, animal companion, the character chooses a companion from the list of available animals. Uh, animal companion can wear barding and gains new abilities as they advance. Uh, order, each cavalier chooses an order to join. The order gives them an ability to challenge an enemy, gaining advantages against them. Uh, each order is give the challenge its own unique advantages. It also gives the Cavalier additional abilities as they advance. And Tactician. 
The character gains bonus command feats that empower allies who fight side by side if they have the same feats. It gives their effects to all teammates. So essentially, Tactician works kind of like Inquisitor. You get free bonus teamwork feats that you can then give to all of your allies within a certain range. Uh, something that they added to the character creation in Wrath of the Righteous that I really, really appreciate is this. Uh, you can, at a quick glance, see what the archetypes add from the base class and what they lose from the base class. So the Beast Rider gets Animal Companion and uh, they can't wear heavy armor. It's only medium and light. But they can ride exotic animals like dinosaurs and things like that. A Cavalier of the Paw is a race-specific class. Uh, that's something I really like that they added in this game, are race-specific classes. So a Cavalier of the Paw, you have to be a halfling. Uh, the Paladin has a new archetype called the Stone Lord Paladin, uh, where you have to be a dwarf to play that. A Cavalier of the Paw is a more defensive-focused archetype, and you don't have to choose your order, because when you select this, you are automatically a, a part of the Order of the Paw. And they can ride, since they're a halfling, they can ride a medium-sized mount. Uh, something I forgot to mention. Uh, mounts, well, mounts are new in this game. You can now uh, participate in mounted combat. But in order to mount an animal companion, you have to be one size category smaller. Uh, since halflings are considered small, they can ride medium-sized animal companions, like dogs and wolves, which is their whole shtick here. Yeah, it's a more defensive-focused um Archetype, their challenge gives them a bonus to dodge, I believe. A Disciple of the Pike gets advantages against fighting larger enemies, enemies larger than themselves. A Fearsome Leader, I believe, is an Alcat created archetype. It's not part of the tabletop. Uh, they build around Dazzling Display and Fear. I think an Orc would actually make for a very good Fearsome Leader, uh, if only for Fearmonger here. So at third level, Fearsome Leader gains a plus one bonus on persuasion skill checks made to intimidate, increasing by plus one for every three levels thereafter. Uh, orcs get a, I think, a plus two bonus to intimidate checks. But they also can use Dazzling Display to help try to remove fear effects from their allies. It's a pretty neat class, I think, but not what we're going for. Uh, Knight of the Wall is a defensive focused archetype. Uh, they get a bunch of bonuses to their shield. They also start with shield focus. As you go down, you get deflective shield and soul shield. Defensive challenge. Again, a very defensive focused uh, archetype. Uh, standard banner goes all in on the banner feature of the class. And that's all I really know about it. We're going to be playing the Gendarme. The Gendarme cares less for the finer points of tactical precision than he does for the exhilaration of the charge, the rush of wind through the visor of his helmet, the feel of his couched lance. The satisfying shriek of armor giving way before his weapon's force as the point drives past metal into its foes. Another thing, uh, cavaliers on the tabletop get advantages when mounted and using a lance. There are no lances in this game. Uh, you're supposed to be... the substitute are long spears. They'll be using a long spear as we play through this. So the gendarme loses tactician and the bonus feats from Tactician, but instead he gets a bunch of regular bonus feats. As we're essentially a fighter. We get a, we get a lot of bonus feats. So a bonus feats, the Gendarme trains to be a mounted terror, almost to the exclusion of all other abilities. He gains bonus a combat or mounted combat feats at first level, third level, and then every three levels thereafter. We lose Tactician and Tactician, so I don't need to read that. Uh, challenge. So once per day, a Cavalier can challenge a foe to combat. As a swift action, the Cavalier chooses one target within sight to challenge. The Cavalier's melee attacks deal extra damage whenever the attacks are made against the target of his challenge. This extra damage is equal to the Cavalier's level. The Cavalier can use this ability once per day at first level, plus one additional time per day for every three levels beyond first, to a maximum of seven times per day at 19th level. Challenging a foe requires much of the Cavalier's concentration. The Cavalier takes a minus two penalty to his armor class, except against attacks made by the target of his challenge. The challenge remains in effect until the target is dead, or unconscious, or until co the combat ends. Each Cavalier's challenge also includes another effect, which is listed in the section describing the Cavalier's order. So, order. At first level, a Cavalier must pledge himself to a specific order. 
The order grants the cavalier a number of bonuses, class skills, and special abilities. Animal Companion Unlike normal animals of its kind, an animal companion's hit dice, abilities, skills, and feats advance as the druid advances in level, or cavalier. If a character receives an animal companion from more than one source, her effective druid level stacks for the purposes of determining the statistics and abilities of the companion. Most animal companions increase in size when their druid reaches 4th or 7th level, depending on the companion. Then weapon and armor proficiency. A cavalier is proficient with all simple and martial weapons, with all types of armor, heavy, light, medium, and with shields except tower shields. As we level up, at level 3 we get a bonus feat and cavalier's charge. At 3rd level a cavalier learns to make more accurate charge attacks while mounted. The cavalier receives a plus 4 bonus on melee attack rolls on a charge while mounted, instead of the normal plus 2. In addition, the cavalier does not suffer any penalty to his armor class after making a charge attack while mounted. And then banner. At 5th level a cavalier's banner becomes a symbol of inspiration to his allies and companions. As long as the Cavalier's banner is clearly visible, our allies within 60 feet receive a plus 2 morale bonus on saving throws against fear, and a plus 1 morale bonus on attack rolls uh, made as part of a charge. At 10th level and every 5 levels thereafter, these bonuses increase by plus 1. A bonus feat level 6, we lose the uh, teamwork bonus feat. Bonus feat at level 9, we lose these. At level 11 we get mighty charge. At 11th level, a cavalier learns to make devastating charge attacks while mounted. Double the threat range of any weapons wielded during a charge while mounted. Uh, this increase does not stack with other effects that increase the threat range of the weapon. In addition, the cavalier can make a free bull rush and trip combat maneuver if his charge attack is successful. Uh, these free combat maneuvers do not provoke an attack of opportunity. Alright, level 12 we get another bonus feat and demand demanding challenge. At 12th level, whenever a cavalier declares a challenge, his target must pay attention to the threat he poses. As long as the target is within the threatened area of the cavalier, it takes a minus 2 penalty to its armor class from attacks made by anyone other than the cavalier. At level 14, we get Greater Banner. At 14th level, the cavalier's banner becomes a rallying call to his allies. All allies within 60 feet receive a plus 2 morale bonus on saving throws against charm and compulsion spell effects. Spells and effects. Bonus feat at level 15, bonus feat at level 18, uh, bonus feat at level 20, and transfixing, transfixing charge. I don't know what I was trying to say there. At 20th level, a gendarme represents the epitome of mounted combat. Whenever he makes a charge attack while mounted, he deals triple the normal damage. So this is where the gendarme really sh shines. The other classes get, I think, double the damage and a stun effect or some other effect. Uh, the Gendarme is the only one that gets triple damage. Uh, pen and paper, I think it requires that he uses a lance, but again, since lances aren't incorporated to this game, it works with any weapon. Uh, in addition, if the Gendarme confirms a critical hit on a charge attack while mounted, the attack deals additional damage equal to his weapon damage. I think that's also unique to the Gendarme. Uh, additional damage from weapon properties, magic effects, precision-based bonuses, or other increases are rolled normally. So this is what we're going for here. We're going to pure damage. That's what this build is all about. Alright, so this uh, Wrath of the Righteous also adds three new races. The Oriad, the Dampier, and the Kitsune. If you're interested in this build, but you don't want to play as the Dampier, because there are some drawbacks to playing an Undead. Uh, human is good for it as well. You get an extra feat and extra skill points. Always good. Uh, Half Orc is also really good. Mostly because of intimidating, so half orcs receive a plus two racial bonus on persuasion checks when used to intimidate due to their fearsome nature. Uh, the Cavalier is a charisma based martial class, which is my absolute favorite. I do think that the fearsome leader would work really well with the half orc since everything is built around dazzling display anyway, and they get fearmonger, so he gets an extra bonus to intimidate. Uh, the Asimar, if you go Asimar and Angelkin, uh, you get the plus two bonus to strength and charisma. It's also really good for this build. Uh, the Oriad also has the Gem Soul, which also gives a plus two bonus to strength and charisma. But you do lose two to wisdom. 
but we're going to be going to the Dampier, so we get the Dampier Heritage. I presented here alternative Dampiers descended from specific breeds of vampires. A player may choose one of the following heritages for her Dampier in place of the traditional Dampier racial features, which are assumed to be born from less pure or mixed heritages. We'll get to that when we get there. A negative energy affinity. Although a living creature, a Dampier reacts to positive and negative energy as if they were undead. A positive energy harms them. The a positive? Positive energy harms them, while negative energy heals them. This might cause some issues as we go through the game. We'll see. We'll have to adapt. I'm sure I'll end up taking out my own, own character at some point. Uh, resist level drain. A Dampier takes no penalties from energy drain effects. And then undead resistance. Dampiers gain a plus two racial bonus on saving throws against disease and mind affecting effects. All right, so the half-living children of vampires birthed by human females. Dampiers are progenies of both horror and tragedy. The circumstances of a Dampier's conception are often called into question, but scarcely understood, as few mortal mothers survive the childbirth. Those who do often abandon their monstrous children or refuse to speak of the matter. While some speculate that Dampiers result when mortal women couple with vampires, others claim that they form when a pregnant woman suffers a vampire bite. Some particularly zealous scholars even contest Dampier status as a unique race, instead viewing them as humans suffering from an unholy affliction. Indeed, this hypothesis is strengthened by Dampier's seemingly, seeming inability to reproduce, the offspring inevitably humans, usually sorcerers with the undead bloodline. It will be going the Meroiborn, the Svetocher. Uh, Dampiers who can trace their heritage to Meroi are known as Svetochers, they inherit much of the unnatural charm and beauty exhibited by their vampiric forebears. But Tochers tend to have an easier time than other Dampiers when associating with mortals, so they must be careful that their relatively wanton social interactions do not breed jealousy, resentment, or disdain. They are more often hunted out of covetness, covetness, covetousness, there we go, I was missing a syllable there, or spite than outright prejudice. So they typically develop social skills that allow them to soothe wounds caused by accidental slights or careless acts. Svetochers have a plus two racial bonus to strength and charisma, and a minus two penalty to constitution. A plus two racial bonus on persuasion when used for diplomacy and knowledge world checks. And we get to select the background. This is also new to the Wrath of the Righteous. Uh, Kingmaker did not have this available. There are a few I think this build would benefit from. Uh, the first is Nomad, which would give your animal companion plus three health. It's not a lot but it's more than you would have without it. It's not where we're going to go, though. Another potential option is the River Kingdom's Daredevil, which gives you a plus two bonus to armor class against attacks of opportunity. As a Cavalier, we're going to be running in and out of combat a lot to charge. But again, we're not going that. I'm going to go with the Andoran Diplomat. The Andoran Diplomat adds persuasion to the list of her class skills. Uh, she also gets a plus two bonus on diplomacy skill checks. And so this is also a nice change. Uh, it's a universal description. If the character already has the class skill, weapon proficiency, or armor proficiency granted by the selected background or class during character creation, then the corresponding bonuses from background change to a plus one competence bonus in case of skills, a plus one enhancement bonus in case of weapon proficiency, and a minus one armor check penalty reduction in case of armor proficiency. So basically get a plus one to attack a few uh, have a redundant proficiency, which is really nice. So it, it opens up more roleplay options and you're not limited by trying to optimize your early game. All right, and our attributes. I'm gonna read through all of these. Uh, so strength, strength measures muscle and physical power. There are examples where you apply your character's strength modifier. Melee attack rolls, damage rolls when using a melee weapon or a thrown weapon, and athletic skill checks. Most builds of fighters, barbarians, and cavaliers require high strength. Strength also sets the maximum amount of weight your character can carry. I'm going to go ahead and put that to 20. A dexterity. Dexterity. Uh, scroll down. There we go. Oh, come on now. A dexterity measures agility, reflexes, and balance. Here are examples where you apply your character's dexterity modifier. Uh, ranged attack rules, including those for attacks made with bows, crossbows, throwing axes, and many ranged spell attacks like Scorching Ray. 
Armor class, a provided that current bonus is not limited by the armor's maximum dexterity bonus. A most heavy armor has a max dexterity bonus of plus two. So you have up to optimally 14 dexterity. There are some exceptions like mithril armor and things like that. Uh, reflex saving throws for avoiding fireballs and other attacks that you can escape by moving quickly. Trickery, mobility, and stealth skill checks. This ability is vital for characters seeking to excel with ranged weapons such as the bow. Most builds of rogues, slayers, hunters, monks, and rangers require high dexterity. I'm going to put two points into that. That will give us plus one armor class. Alright, constitution. A constitution bonus increases a character's hit points so the ability is important for all classes. Here are examples where you apply your character's constitution modifier. Fortitude saving throws for resisting death effects, poison, disease, and similar threats. Hit points your character gets when they gain a level. The character's constitution score changes enough to alter their constitution modifier. The character's hit points also increase or decrease accordingly. So we're going to pop this up to 12. And, um... He's just going to use intelligence as a dumb stat. Intelligence doesn't help our build outside of skill points, and I don't care for skill points. Uh, you get one guaranteed skill point per level no matter what, and I'm just going to put that into Persuasion. Uh, so Intelligence determines how well your character learns and reasons. Animal Companions require Intelligence Score 3 to gain access to many new feats. Here are examples where you apply your character's Intelligence modifier. The number of skill points gained each level. The character always gets at least one skill point per level. Uh, knowledge Arcana and Knowledge World Checks. Uh, Alchemists, Arcanists, Witches, Magi, and Wizards gain bonus spells based on the intelligence score. The minimum intelligence score needed to cast their spells is 10 plus the spell's level. Uh, wisdom. Uh, wisdom describes a character's willpower, common sense, awareness, and intuition. If you want your character to have acute senses, put a high score in Wisdom. Here are examples where you apply your character's Wisdom modifier. Will saving throws for negating the effects of charm, person, and other spells. Perception, Lore Nature, and Lore Religion skill checks. Uh, clerics, Druids, Inquisitors, War Priests, Hunters, Shamans, and Rangers get bonus spells based on their Wisdom scores. Uh, the minimum Wisdom score needed to cast their spell is 10 plus the spell's level. And then Charisma. My favorite attribute in CRPGs. Uh, Charisma measures a character's power of personality, personal magnetism, ability to lead, and appearance. Here are examples where you apply your character's charisma modifier. Persuasion and use magic skill use magic device skill checks. Uh, channel energy DCs for clerics and paladins attempting to harm undead foes. Bards, paladins, blood ragers, oracles, scalds, and sorcerers get a number of bonus spells based on their charisma scores. The minimum charisma score needed to cast their spell is 10 plus the spell's level. So I've always been drawn to charisma based classes in RPGs. To me it makes sense because as the main character you're almost always thrust into a leadership position even if it's just in charge of your party. As often your party is pulled like you're pulling all these random people together to work towards a single goal. And oftentimes they might not even get get along. So it makes sense for the main character to have a high charisma score. And then you to take it a step further like in Pathfinder Keymaker where you became a baron and then a king. It makes sense for a king to have a high charisma. Let's go ahead and get to our skills. Yeah, let's read all these. Alright, so athletics. Uh, the skill depends on strength ability score. Armor penalties applied to the skill check. The skill checks. Athletics represent the character's talent at deeds of physical prowess, such as leaping or scaling walls. For example, is where you apply your character's athletic skill to move a heavy object, climb an obstacle, and jump. We'll put one point into that. A mobility. The skill depends on dexterity, ability, score, armor penalties applied to the skill check. Mobility represents character's talent for balance and coordination, including aerial maneuvers, gymnastics, and tumbling. Here are examples where you apply your character's mobility skill to move past opponents without provoking attacks of opportunity, squeeze through a tight through a tight spots through tight spots and climb and jump a trickery the skill depends on dexterity ability score the skill cannot be used if your character is not trained in it armor penalties apply to the skill check 
A tricker represents character's talent to perform tasks that require fine manipulation. Here are examples where you apply your character's trickery skill to. Disarm traps or devices, open locks on doors and chests. A stealth uses dexterity. A stealth represents a character's talent at avoiding detection, allowing the character to slip past foes or strike from an unseen position. You can use it uh, to avoid random encounters on a global map or during rest, and moving past enemies without them noticing. A knowledge arcana uses dexterity. Wait, wait, no, that's not right. Yeah, that didn't even sound right. A knowledge arcana uses intelligence. A knowledge arcana represents characters' knowledge about spells, magic items, and numerous bits of magical lore. You can use uh, it during arcane spell scroll scribing during camping, identification of found magical items, and to learn spells from spellbooks and scrolls. A knowledge world also uses intelligence. A knowledge world represents characters' knowledge about people, systems that make civilization run, historical events that made societies what they are today. You can use it to brew potions during camping, decipher writing in foreign languages, recall knowledge about ge geography, history, locals, or nobility. A lore nature uses wisdom. Lore nature represents characters' knowledge about the natural world and ability to command and train wild creatures. It allows you to recall knowledge about dungeons or nature. Gives an ability to cure a disease, delays fatigue while traveling on the world map. Lore religion also uses wisdom. A lore religion represents characters' knowledge about the secrets of deities, holy lore, and extraplanar realms. Divine spells scroll scribing during camping, recall knowledge about the planes or religions. Perception uses wisdom as well. Perception represents characters' acuity of your senses, allows you to notice fine details, see danger coming, and tell if people are behaving suspiciously. Uh, notice traps and hidden objects. Determine your chances to not be surprised in case of a sudden attack on your camp. Alright, Persuasion. Uh, the skill depends on Charisma Ability Score. Uh, persuasion represents a character's talent to manipulate other people through negotiation, deceit, or intimidation. And you can change other others' attitudes or opinions. One point there. The Nese Magic Device also depends on your Charisma score. Nese Magic Device skill represents character's talent at activating magic items, even if you're not otherwise trained in their use. Activate wands and scrolls that you would normally be unable to use. Alright, and we get to select our feats. So I'm gonna choose... I would argue it's not really optimal. At level 1, but we're gonna choose Persuasive. So you get a plus 2 bonus on all Persuasion and Perception skill checks. If you have 10 or more ranks in one of these skills, the bonus increases to plus 4 for that skill. I'm doing this because in Kingmaker, there were some early game Persuasion checks, and if we run across any in this game, I want to make sure that we can pass them. So we're going to go ahead and grab this. Alright, so Order. This is unique to the Cavalier, as we've already covered. There are five options. And there are two that would be really, really fitting for this build. Uh, one that we can't select because the Order of the Shroud is an anti-undead order. And we're playing a Dampier who is undead. So we cannot select that one. Uh, Order of the Lion is a more defensive-oriented one. Uh, he actually gets an ability here, uh, Shield of the Liege. That allows him to give his adjacent allies a plus three shield bonus to their armor class. I think even his challenge is defense. Yeah, it's defensive as well. Order of the Star is a almost like a Cavalier Paladin hybrid. And then uh, Order of the Sword, I think, is the best damage order. And it's one of the two that I was tempted to select. Uh, for pure damage purposes, this one is the best. Order of the Cockatrice is also good for damage, but also provides some other utility. And thematically, I think Order of the Cockatrice is going to fit my character better. So this is what we're going to go with. So a cavalier who belongs to this order serves only himself, working to further his own aims and increase his own prestige. Cavaliers of this order tend to be selfish and concerned only with personal goals and objectives. So my character is a glory seeker. The whole point of my character, he wants to achieve immortality through feats and renown. Uh, thank you know, Achilles, very reminiscent of him. So the order of the cockatrice his uh, challenge 
Whenever an Order of the Cockatrice Cavalier issues a challenge, he receives a plus one morale bonus on all melee damage rolls made against the target of this of his challenge, as long as he is the only creature threatening the target. This bonus increases by plus one for every four levels the Cavalier possesses. Not a huge fan of that, since he has to essentially be soloing the target in order for him to get the bonus. We'll make it work. Uh, he also starts with Dazzling Display. Your skill with your favorite weapon can frighten enemies. A benefit, while wielding the weapon in which you have weapon focus, you perform a bewildering show of prowess as a full round action. Make a Persuasion Intimidate check to demoralize all foes within 30 feet who can see your display. Then Braggart. At second level, the Cavalier receives Dazzling Display as a bonus feat. The Cavalier receives a plus two morale bonus on melee attack rolls made against targets under fear effects. So use this, it'll shake all the targets around him. And then he gets a bonus when attacking those same enemies. Steal Glory at level 8. At 8th level, the Cavalier can steal the glory from another creature's successful strike. Whenever a creature other than the Cavalier scores a critical hit against a target that the Cavalier is threatening, he can make an attack of opportunity against the same target. I feel like these contradict each other. Because he challenges it, but he has to be the only one attacking it to get the full benefit. But this one, he gets benefit if his whole party is attacking the same target. Anyway, a moment of triumph at level 15. At 15th level, the Cavalier can, as a free action, declare a moment of triumph. For one round, the Cavalier receives a competence bonus equal to his charisma modifier on all ability checks, attack rolls, damage rolls, saving throws, and skill checks. This bonus is also added to his armor class. In addition, any critical threats he makes are automatically confirmed. The Cavalier can use this ability once per day. Super powerful. Uh, the horse is the only animal companion we have available. It's also the only animal companion that starts as large, so we can mount it right away. All the other animal companions either start as small or medium, and unless you are playing as a halfling, cannot be mounted. So size large, speed 50 foot, armor class plus four natural armor, attack bite one to four, two hooves one to six. Ability score is 16 strength, 13 dex, 15 constitution, Two Intelligence, 12 Wisdom, and 6 Charisma. Uh, special Qualities, Low Light Vision, and Scent. At 4th level, gains 2 Strength and 2 Constitution. When riding a horse, you gain a plus 1 bonus to Armor Class, and on attack rolls against enemies of medium size or smaller. So I think that pairs really well with the Order of the Pike. If you chose an Order of the Pike Cavalier. So you get bonuses against large enemies, and then with the horse, you get bonuses against smaller enemies. All right, and another feat. I'm going to grab another arguably suboptimal feat. I'm going to grab toughness. We don't have a lot of health, and since we are a dampier, our healing options are a little limited. And so I'm going to try and buffer my health a bit. Uh, so with toughness, you gain plus three hit points. For every hit die you possess beyond three, you gain an additional plus one hit point. If you have more than three hit dice, you gain a plus one. You gain plus one hit points whenever you gain a hit die, such as when you gain a level. And then for deities, uh, there's a few good ones. I wanted a deity that has the glory domain. I think there's only three of them. Shaylin. Yeah, Shaylin's one of the ones that has... No. It's Renray. Has glory. And uh, Iomade also has glory, but Gorum has glory, strength, and war. Which are the three pillars of my character. So we're going to select Gorum. Gorum, also known as our Lord in Iron, is a god of battle above all their pursuits. It said that he would rust away into nothingness if there was ever a time with no more conflicts to be fought. His faithful belief he is present in every iron weapon of war that is forged. So domains are chaos, destruction, glory, strength, and war. Favorite weapons are great swords, which we won't be using. I'm going to be chaotic good. I'm not committed to this. I'm just going to kind of pick things as I go. I'm not really worried about my alignment in this playthrough. I'm not a paladin, so I don't have to worry about it. 
All right, and then we make our or change our appearance. All right, make him a little bulkier. Yeah, we'll go with the uh, the broader face. I don't want any scars. My favorite hairstyle in the Pathfinder games. Some nice gray hair. I'm starting to go gray myself, so I think that's fitting. I uh, know war paint and I like, I love copper armor. I don't think there's any any prettier material for armor than copper. It just, it looks so good. All right, and there's our character. I'm always ready. We will be victorious. Ready to choose the pragmatic voice. And since we're playing as a knight, well, As it'll be named like a knight. At the Pillar of Chivalry, uh, the great Don Quixote de la Mancha. Our birthday will be 26. Eridus. I didn't even break a sweat. And there he is. There's our character. Yeah, if we didn't take toughness, we'd only have 12 health, which is a little scary for a frontline. Frontline uh, character. Yeah, that is uh, our character, Don Quixote, the Dampier Cavalier, Order of the Cockatrice. And next time we'll jump into the campaign proper and see how we how we fare. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.